if you shower or brush your teeth or try to make your hair look presentable, here's some good news. Dollar Shave Club has a lot of stuff to help you out. Dollar Shave Club delivers everything you need to look, feel, and smell your best. Shampoo, conditioner, body wash, toothpaste, hair gel, even a wipe that leaves your tush feeling tingly clean. All of Dollar Shave Club's products are made with top-shelf ingredients that won't break your budget. You'll feel the difference. Plus, shipping is free with your membership. And here's a great way to try a bunch of Dollar Shave Club's products for just 5 bucks. You can get their Daily Essential Starter Set. It comes with Body Cleanser, One Wipe Charlie's, their amazing butt wipes, and their world-famous shave butter. And their best razor, the Six Blade Executive. Keep the blades coming for a few more bucks a month and add in a shampoo, toothpaste, or anything else you need. Check it all out at dollarshaveclub.com slash chat. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash chat. Independent in thoughts and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. I want it to be comprehensive. I actually think it's a good thing for Judge Kavanaugh. I think it's actually a good thing. Not a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. Now, with that being said, I'd like it to go quickly. Quickly. Well, we'll see if it's going to go quickly or not. Very interesting. Uh, this whole investigation. And it, you know what's funny is you're hearing all of... So you've got the right and the left fighting already over fighting over the investigation. How should it go? When will it end? Where, what can they do? What can't they do? Dick Blumenthal. The White House seems to be micromanaging and straightjacketing an investigation that must uncover the facts and evidence necessary to determine whether Brett Kavanaugh is qualified to sit on the highest court in the land. No, that's not what they do. They're investigating a situation. You guys are supposed to find out if he's qualified to do the job. He could be a wonderful human being with nothing hanging over him and not qualified to sit on the highest court in the land. That's your job. Are they straight jacking, micromanaging it? Potentially. But they're looking at a situation, especially the president, where he's going, okay, look at the Mueller investigation. Where we started and where we are, two different things. It was all about collusion, the Russians, and all of this stuff. Nobody, and that's the thing that he's so angry about when it comes to this entire investigation, when it comes to him, is the fact that there isn't any restraint. There wasn't any parameters put on it. There wasn't a lane it was told to stay in, so it gave Mueller free roam, room to roam. So what he's trying to say is, look, we need to put it in a situation where, look, you can investigate A, B, and C, and that's it, Right? That's it. A, B, and C. We don't want you out there investigating, well, what did he do as a, you know, even though there wasn't rape here, maybe he had too much to drink here. Or maybe he, you know, he got into it in, in a fist fight with a friend. And uh, I mean, th- that's the insanity of where they're worried about it going. And I completely understand that. Uh, and I think that, you know, there should be parameters on all these investigations because if they're just going to investigate for the investigate's sake they could be there forever and a day and what they could eventually catch him on or whatever they're trying to do could have nothing to do with anything and that's what the left is hoping for so yes in the end it's about giving him parameters it's about putting in a situation and even flake Right. Even Jeff Flake, who everybody hates right now. And I'm going to tell you something about Jeff Flake. There's a lot of you out there that can't stand Jeff Flake. I got a lot of of, you know, how horrible he is. He's a rhino. I am telling you this now. There is more than meets the eye that people will find out later on down the line about why he did what he did. If you think that they were going to ram it through and that they had this done and all they had to do was vote yes without any kind of thing. Guess again, there were other people that had concerns on the right side of the aisle that would not have voted for him without this. So it was this or nothing. Period. Case closed. This or nothing. 323 538 2423 at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. Uh, last night, Jeff Flake uh, was on 60 Minutes with uh, Chris Coombs talking about uh, just this entire situation. And, uh, you know, Kavanaugh and and how he thought it went. I have to say that when I heard him, I heard someone who 
I hope I would sound like if I had been unjustly accused and to see his family behind him. And uh, it was it was anger. Uh, but um, but if I were unjustly accused, that's how I would feel as well. And I, I as it went on, um, I think his interaction with some of the members uh, was a little too sharp. Yeah, I, I get that. But. He's saying what nobody he's he, his common sense enough. And, and again, a lot of people out there can't stand him. I think he's running for office at some point in time and a bigger office. And that office is in, in uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. Yeah, I think he's going to run for president. He even said he probably couldn't do this if 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 reelection was in his future. He probably couldn't have done this. So this gave them the freedom to do this. But also, you know, there were other there were other factors that were at work behind the scenes. But. The interesting thing is, is, is everybody is like how angry he was, how mad he was, how, how testy he was, how dare he do this? How dare he act the way he did? How dare he be angry at something like this? I was really stunned uh, by how he acted at that hearing. This is a basically a job interview for the highest court of the land. Uh, her testimony was compelling, incredible. Well, both accounts can't be true. And so one one idea here is that he simply was drinking more than he was saying over this time period and that he didn't remember what happened. And so I was just simply trying to get at that. And that's Amy Klobacher from uh, uh, Minnesota. And so that's one idea, right? That is one idea. It's a job offer. Well, I mean, it's a job interview. I've never gone to a job interview where they looked at me and go, so I hear you're a rapist. And these people over here who may hire you or may not hire think you're a rapist, think you're an alcoholic rapist, think that you 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 put people in positions to be raped as a child. That was your job. You were like uh, the front man. It's like the movie Taken, right? You're at the airport and you're 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 trying to get people to share rides with you. And then you tell your friends, hey, come on over here. I drugged them all up. Come rape them. No. So how how would how would you feel? Right. How would anybody feel? Any reasonable, sane human being, man or woman, black or white, gay or straight, would be pissed off, would be angry. And if you're sitting there for days, and we think about this for a second. He had days of being called all kinds of things. He had days of seeing his name dragged through the mud. He had days of sitting there stewing and being angry. And finally, he had his chance to come forward and defend himself. And do I think at times he was a little bit harsh? Uh, I can understand that. Yeah, he probably would. But couldn't any reasonable, sane human being understand that? He had exchanges with Senator Feinstein, with Senator Klobuchar, with others that uh, I thought went over a line. Um, he was clearly belligerent, um, aggressive, angry. Yeah, as anybody would. Now, at the same time, things you don't hear about. So I was just simply trying to get at that and really couching it in the fact that I had alcoholism in my own family. My dad, who's 90 now, struggled with it throughout his life and finally got treatment and is sober and got help from AA. And so I was actually trying to get at the truth. And sure. so that's why I was mm -hmm. stunned by how he answered it. But then, of course, he... He later apologized. Yeah, but you're trying to diagnose him as an alcoholic. Minus me, I can name no people I've ever met who didn't party as a, as a high schooler. Producer Phil, you and I are the same age. You're nearly the same age as our friend over here as I am, uh, Judge Kavanaugh. Did you maybe at times have a few beverages of the adult nature when you were in high school? Um, on the advice of counsel, I choose not to answer that question. That's a yes. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Right? But that's what we're getting at. Well, he, you know, I've got friends who are alcoholics. My dad was an alcoholic. <laughs> that's, that's the craziness of it all. But this was never about and still continues to be never about this person and his well-being, or Dr. Ford and her well-being, this has only to do with the fact that they want to stop him at all costs by any means necessary. That's it. No more. By any means necessary. We'll see what happens. Oh, God. And I saw people over the weekend hammering, oh, you know, it's because he's white. You're like, what? Yeah, it's because he's an angry white man. What does him being white have anything to do with this? 
I'm sure if you accused a black man of rape and doing all of these kind of things, I would expect them to be angry as well and push back. Or a woman. I would expect her. Let's just say he doesn't. All right, for the sake of arguments, he doesn't get through this process. And then they go, uh, Amy uh, Coney Barrett is the one they, they come after next. And they go after her hardcore. I would expect her to push back. And if you call her a child molester, let's just say, right? Like this is hypothetical here. Do you think she's going to be pissed and angry? Right? If you say, hey, I hear you bite the heads off chickens. That's what I heard. And that at night you do satanic worship in your house and that you, uh, you know, you mainline, uh, whatever. Do you think that maybe there'd be a pushback and anger? I'm just curious. I think everybody has a right to be pissed off and angry that sometimes everybody has a right to push back. And I would expect anybody to be accused of anything to push back in that direction. Don't care what it is. You should. You should be pissed. You should be angry. Doesn't mean it's the right. Well, it's a job. It's a job interview. I've never been in a job interview where they've uh, they've tried to destroy your life. And I'm still not. I've still not been in that job interview yet. Like, hey, we're calling you in, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna ask you some questions. Oh, and by the way, half the room is gonna hate you and accuse you of doing horrible things because <laughs> they don't want you to get the job. Three two three five three eight twenty four twenty three at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. It's the Chad Benson Show. Experiencing separation anxiety? <laughs> That's dumb. Check out Chad twenty four seven at his website chadbensonshow dot com and on iTunes. Free. The Chad Benson Show. 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 Never feel lonely again. The Democratic leader and the ranking Democrat on the committee both said recently that an FBI investigation can be completed in less than a week. But Mr. President, I'd bet almost anything that after it runs its course in the next few days, we will then be treated to a lecture, a lecture, that anything short of a totally unbounded fishing expedition of indefinite duration is too limited or too arbitrary or somehow insufficient. We all know that's coming. If you listen carefully, Mr. President, you can practically hear the sounds of the Democrats moving the goalposts. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's I mean, they're they're doing that in life. That that's the thing that drives me crazy. It's not just in the Kavanaugh thing. People in this touchy feely world, uh, we've been moving the goalposts for a very long time. It doesn't matter. You tweet something today. People laugh at it. Six months from now, you are a horrible human being. Right. Oh, my God. You, I didn't know you were like, well, you laughed at it. You LOL'd me. Ah, it's different than I'm woke now. I wasn't woke then, but I'm woke now. That's totally the difference. Translation. I can move the goalposts. I can make up the rules. I can do what I want. Now, apparently, Mark Judge has spoken and it's not quite, you know, finished. There's more to do and. His former college classmate has said, I've seen him quite drunk. I'm not quite sure what a partying kid in college or high school, why that disqualifies. Because if that's disqualifying, then it shouldn't, by and large, most people have to give up what they're doing? Well, it's different, Chad, because he's a judge. Okay. So he wasn't a kid. He always knew what he was going to be. It was that was it. He was never going to be a kid. He was a judge. Instead of he at school, he was a judge. No, I mean this is this is the stuff of of ridiculousness that they're trying to. Well, they're getting him. You know, you know, well, did I drink heavily? I mean, what's heavily? I mean, he got through Yale, right? He got through Yale. Well, I saw him drinking. Are we going to have to say? Well, he got drunk twenty two times. From the time he was in high school to the time he got out of college. So 20 was the threshold. He's past that threshold. So we can officially call him whatever. I mean, that, this is the reach we're going for. And my fear is this is where we're headed in this wacky world. What's going to happen as we move forward? Huh? If they do this to him, call him every bad, vile name in the world and get upset because he pushes back then God help the next nominee. Yeah, really. 
That's something to think about. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. If this is it, and you heard him, you've heard him more than once. God help the nominee. He said it last week, saying it again. He's going to continue to say it the next one. And if we're going to go back now and we're going to start to say our morals from today because we judge you to be X, Y, and Z, right? And we're looking at you as these are our morals. And back then, I look back and say, while it was okay for other kids to drink, it was okay for other kids to do things like this. We feel that you should have been above it at 17 and 18. <sighs> Ridiculous. And I don't even drink, for God's sakes. Crazy. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter each and every day at this time. We like to give you something that makes you, well, it makes you a part of the today world, the hip crowd, the hipsters, the Twitterers, the Instagrammers. We call this our urban word of the day. It's time for the urban word of the day, fam. What? Right now? Time to get a little more hip on the streets. I can't understand a word you're saying. Urban word of the day. Ooh, I like this one. Spit and truth. Ooh, what's that? Spit and truth? Simple. When you get out there and spit a little truth, you throw it out there to somebody. That person's spitting truth, meaning whatever he or she is saying is absolute truth, period. Case closed. Cannot be disputed because they are spitting truth. I used to like say spitting facts, but whatever you want to call it, you can call it. But spitting truth is your urban word of the day thank you for saying that and dated urban slang so that i'll understand you that there was the urban word of the day we damn stretched your cranium what we all didn't see was that apparently he stayed on stage during a commercial break he gave a pro-trump rant causing some in the audience to boo and so many times i talk to like a white person about this and i say how did you like trump he's racist well, uh, if I was concerned about racism, I would have moved out of America a long time ago. And now it's yeah, he got booed, old Kanye there, wore the MAGA hat and the whole nine yards. And he's an interesting character because I always tell everybody, remember, he told everybody in the world standing next to a befuddled Michael My- Mike Myers, not Michael Myers, so that had been interesting, uh, that uh, George Bush hates black people. And then here he is doing the thing that he does. He He's interesting. And apparently... He's reached out to Kaepernick to try to broker some sort of meeting with Donald Trump, him, and Kaepernick, which I would find interesting. Wouldn't it be interesting if the dad, that's something Donald Trump would do? Very, very interesting. But I just love, you know what? I just like a person that kind of does their own thing without the group think world, especially in a Hollywood world that he lives in. And I, you know, and I know some of it is probably just to piss off everybody, but. He's a very interesting character, old Kanye. 323 538 at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Love hearing from you. Will she or won't she run? Plus, somebody's unfriended me because of something I posted today. We'll talk about that as well. Oh, kids, we're just getting started. It's Chad Benson Show. Chad Benson Show. Independent in thoughts and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. Now, one year later, after all those shots were fired and still why Stephen Paddock carried out the attack is a mystery. Las Vegas Sheriff Joe Lombardo has a theory that Paddock was angry about losing money to gambling and had mental issues. Without a manifesto or even a note to answer questions, the totality of the information that has been gathered leaves us to only make an educated guess as to the motives of Stephen Paddock. While local police have closed their investigation, the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit is still working on a psychological report on Paddock due out later this year. It's been a year. One year. Uh, Vegas will go dark tonight, and it is still a mystery of what the hell happened. How did this happen? People are 
recalling their stories and what took place. A concert, right? Route 91 or Route 91. It was people having fun, watching all their favorite country. Next thing you know, lives were changed in an instant. We were standing together on the left side of the stage, just kind of listening to the music, enjoying ourselves, and we heard the gunshots start going off, and no one was really sure what it was, if it was, you know, a speaker blowing out or gunfire. I was just kind of questioning it. Then Jason Aldean stopped performing, and he ran off the stage, and the whole stage goes black. And when he stopped and they turned on the emergency lights, that's when I knew, like, something's not right. Still had no idea what it was, but I figured the best move was to get out of there. So I grabbed my mom, and we proceeded to to try and get out as soon as possible. Yeah, and and many stories, many stories like that. And it was just, it, the, the whole thing, again, still is bizarre. And and we sit back, and this is one of those things where we as a, as a people, as a species, if you will, we, we, we want to know, like, what happened, right? And most of it is selfishly for us. We want to figure it out. Could this happen again? Could we be that person? Well, not me. Well, hold on a second. Because out of curiosity, the the humanity of what it is that that, that we do as humans, we want to solve things. And a lot of times we can look at something, whether it's the the guy in, in, you know, Virginia Tech or Sandy Hook or wherever. A lot of times we could point to specific issues inside of their lives that led to a situation like this. This guy? There isn't any of that. There isn't. There isn't any of, hey, it was because of this or because of that. And and, and that's the thing that drives us crazy is this mystery. And, you know, it changed a lot for a lot of people. Thousands of lives changed forever when they had to live through that terrifying night. And now they struggle with all they have to endure. None of us will ever be the same after that night and the days that followed. Yeah. And uh, I had a friend who was there with his wife, uh, my buddy Trav, and uh, he said the the woman next to him just, boom, that was it, like just exploded. And then he tried to help somebody, he pulled a woman who was shot in the chest, and there was nothing he or his wife could do, and it was, you know, the, it was the chaos. He said on top of everything else, the chaos going around because nobody's sure what's going on. And it was, yeah, I mean, that night and still nothing that you can connect. And that's the thing that drives everybody. There's nothing you can, you can't connect A to B, right? Because that's what we want. We just want it to be easy. He was crazy. He was a uh, alt writer. He was, uh, you know, a uh, crazy lunatic, lunatic who hated right wingers. That's why he attacked the country. Uh, he was, uh, you know, all about ISIS. It was. We want simple, and in this there is no simple. There is no ha. That's why it happened. Which makes everything even worse. Three two three five three eight twenty four twenty three at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You could tweet at us. Barack Obama is out doing stuff. Not a shocker. The former president has now thrown his name behind 260 Democratic candidates in federal and state races. On the latest list, he backs Democratic nominees for governor in states like Arizona, Connecticut, Florida, and Michigan. He's backing Christine Hallquist, the first openly transgender major oh, party good. candidate for governor Ooh. in Vermont, and Tony Evers, the superintendent of public instruction in Wisconsin, who's facing off against Governor Scott Walker. In a release, the former president says he's focused on close races in which his support would make a meaningful difference. I love David Garcia. He supports in Arizona. Like, he's never met 99 percent of these people but if he can get out there and like the the big race with martha mcsally because trump is going to come out to arizona the next couple weeks you've got cinema mcsally you know they're going to try to do everything because this is one of those seats that they believe they can flip this is one of those seats that they have a shot at flipping can we flip this seat and it's really interesting when you see, because look, the midterms, for a lot of people, and I saw uh, Bannon over the weekend, he was on with Bill Maher, which was a very interesting thing, because Bill Maher said, hey, look, let's treat this guy kind of cool, can we just be nice? And he comes out and he says, you know what, I, I like the fact that you come on here, because this is why the Democrats are losing, because Republicans are willing to go into the lion's den. And Bannon said, look, I don't I do not do interviews with the Breitbarts and the Foxes or any of that stuff. I, I want to go in and actually... Let's go into the, you know, into the teeth of the line. Let's go into the lion's den. Let's talk about stuff. And I like that. 
But he also said that this this right here will be a referendum on Trump. And this is the first chance where you can look and see what may or may not happen. And you've also got to deal with precedent. A president's party almost always loses seats in a midterm election. There have been like two exceptions in the last 80 years. Second, a party's prospects are generally linked to their president's approval ratings. Currently, Trump's average approval rating this past month is about two points lower than Obama in 2010 when Democrats suffered a disastrous midterm. Interesting. Very interesting. And with this comes a potential here. You know, with, you know, the whole thought process of, hey, could we start an impeachment? And that is something that I think smarter Democrats who are more politically astute, who aren't just riding on emotion, want no part of. I mean, you're not you're not hearing that from the Pelosi's and the Schumer's and stuff because they understand what that does to a country. They realize that. But there are some serious issues here that the Republicans are going to have to deal with. But there are specific problems this time for Republicans. First. Some 40 Republican incumbents are leaving, while only 18 Democrats have announced their retirements, and it's just easier to flip an open seat. Second, 25 House Republicans are in districts carried by Hillary Clinton two years ago, mainly in suburban districts, literally from coast to coast. Only 13 Democratic seats are in Trump-friendly districts. And it is here in suburban America where the president's approval ratings are particularly low. Yeah, that's understandable. More rural America. Uh, and I, I look, I think I, I, I'm, I believe that they will lose the house, but they will hold on to the Senate and it'll be narrow. I do. I believe, I believe there's going to be an issue that, you know, I think the Democrats feel like, Hey, it's all going. This is going to be, this is going to be a runaway thing. We could feel the momentum building, building, but they've just got so much to defend. And that right there is, is the issue comparatively to the house. Senate is completely different. The map for 2018 is nothing less than a nightmare for the Democrats. Only one Republican seat is in a state Clinton carried. That's Nevada. But 10 Democratic incumbents are running in states that Trump carried, five of them by landslides. And in those states, Trump's approval ratings are better than his national average. Right now, Democratic senators are facing serious challenges in Florida, Indiana, Missouri, North Dakota, Montana. Yeah. So I I, I think the the worry that the Senate is going to be lost, I wouldn't be surprised. What if they picked up a seat or two? That changes a lot of things. And remember, a lot of the, we're looking at the Senate here, and the Senate is it's with Kavanaugh. It's SCOTUS. And I think a lot of people were worried that they were going to lose, potentially, the Senate and the House, and the impeachment may start. But the reality of the whole thing is, is that they're able to hold on to things. That will be huge, just in case they do end up blowing out Kavanaugh. It gives them an opportunity to come back with somebody else, Amy Coney Barrett or whoever they choose, which would you know, uh, uh, give Trump again another opportunity. If they're able to pick up some seats, then that would give them some breathing room, which I think they would love to have, like any party would love to have. It's in the red states where the Kavanaugh nomination may play out particularly uh, influentially. Remember, only senators, not congressmen, not House members, vote on confirmation. The feeling was that these red state Democrats might be pushed to vote for confirming Kavanaugh. The recent allegations uh, may make that differently. Also in these states, centrist Democrats are going to be pushed by their Republican opponents on immigration and on whether they embrace the policies of the more progressive left swing of the National Democratic Party. Yeah. And why is that important? Well, because once this is over... People start throwing their hats in the ring. And over the weekend, Elizabeth Warren. Time's up. Time's up. It's time. It's time for women to go to Washington and fix our broken government. And that includes a woman at the top. So here's what I promise. After November 6th, I will take a hard look at running for president. I think we can turn this country around. She's going to wait till after November 6th because she realizes if they don't get what they think they're going to get, this blue tsunami, that maybe, just maybe, people aren't ready for the the uber-progressive side of things. I still think that she's going to throw her hat in the ring. I still think that. But I also think she realizes, too, if 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 they aren't served, 
Meaning, and by that I mean, you know, like, hey, you got served, the, the Republicans, and they're able to hold potentially some some more of the House than they thought they would and definitely maybe pick up a seat or two in the Senate. Then the reality is, is she's got to think, all right, is this what people want, right? Because it's okay to be uber progressive in, in New York and L.A. and Chicago and San Francisco and Seattle, but it doesn't work elsewhere, right? In Massachusetts, it's okay to be uber progressive. But is middle America ready for that? And this populism, and, and Bannon over the weekend said it. Look, the populism of the, the socialist movement, if you will, the let me take care of you movement, let me do all of these things movement, is growing. And I wouldn't be surprised if we have the populist movement of Trump versus the populist movement of somebody like a Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. And those will be our choices in a couple of years. Very interesting. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You could tweet at me. Somebody unfriended me because I did a video earlier. Uh, I'm doing lots of videos. You could, Chad Benson Show TV and, and all over, you know, on the YouTubes and the, everywhere uh, about the sick and tired of the whiteness. And a guy unfriended me and because I was, uh, of course, it was a guilty white guy. It just makes me laugh. Like super guilty white guy. I'm a guilty white guy. And I'm just like, ah, really? See, that is the that is the take my ball going home. I don't like what you said. So rather than say, you know what, I disagree with you, unfriended. That's what he wrote, unfriended. And it just, oh, God, I just sit there laughing. Like, because I have other people that are banter back and forth. And I try to reach out to everybody who, who who's, you know, tweets something or says something. And I got no problem with that. And we can agree to disagree. But when you do something like that, it just makes me think, ugh, how childish are you? Really? Really? Three two three five three eight twenty four twenty three at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. It's Monday, and you're looking around. and You're saying, "Self, I have a job. I need it filled. It's not going the way that I thought it was going to go. I can't figure out how to find this person. What do I do?" ZipRecruiter.com slash Benson. Ooh, tell me more, sir, on the radio. Well, first of all, ZipRecruiter. So let's say you sign up. All right, let's say I sign up, and you send your ad and everything over. It goes out to 100 of the web's leading job boards. Boom. Then they got this technology. It's a powerful matching technology. Tell me more, sir, on the radio. Yeah, and what it does is it goes out and scans resumes, and it finds people that you're kind of looking for, like, hey, you know what? Hey, we're going to invite you to come over here, and invites them to apply for the job. Oh, interesting. Then they, they apply for the job. Then they scan all those resumes and find the best of those resumes that apply for your job, and then voila, within 24 hours. About 80% of people who do this, right, who look for that perfect employee, find an amazing quality candidate through the site within the first day. Highest rating uh, hiring site in America, that's ZipRecruiter. I like it. So why should I use this uh, thing you gave me? Simple. You can post your job for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Benson. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash B-E-N-S-O-N. ZipRecruiter.com slash Benson. Post your job for free today. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. C-H-A-D-B-E-N-S-O-N. Murphy Brown and Last Man Standing. They each debuted last week. I'll tell you why one did really well, and it wasn't because of the politics. Chad Benson Show. Being antisocial sucks. Hang with Chad's friends on Facebook, The Chad Benson Show. And if you just need some alone time, head on over to Twitter at Chad Benson Show. Either way, we can't wait to meet the real you. So producer Phil and I were laughing at Lindsay Lohan. If you didn't see it over the weekend, I guess on Friday, she's in Moscow. And for whatever reason, she thinks these refugees that are probably escaping the war-torn areas they've come from, that they're, they're trafficking children. So it's a family. and She goes over, in a sense, tries to take the kids away or, or tries to intervene, and she gets walloped. But along the way, she's following them, and she's saying things to them, and she's filming the whole thing, right? Because she's insane. And as you said, producer Phil, cocaine's a hell of a drug. But then she gets an accent halfway through. And it starts out to be a little Russian, and then it goes like a little Arab. <laughs> You're just like, what is wrong with you? And then she eventually gets walloped. And she's like, I can't believe it. For all of you who think Kanye's nuts, <laughs> she's lost the plot. That is for damn sure. So over the weekend, Friday night, 
uh, Last Man Standing debuted. Now, Murphy Brown came out last week. It's a rehash of the whole thing. And she said, oh, the only reason I'm doing this is because of Trump. And it became more of a preachy thing. Last Man Standing was on ABC and was dumped by ABC, even though it was the second highest rated comedy they had had. A lot of people decried, oh, it's all about politics. We're like, yeah, but we had Roseanne. And we brought Roseanne back, and she went that way. You brought her back after you dumped him, and you didn't know it was going to go the way it goes. So let's just slow your roll there. But Tim Allen did talk about the politics of the show. <laughs> Last Man Standing stars Tim Allen and Nancy Travis are excited to rejoin their TV family. She's being a right-wing idiot. She's being a left-wing idiot. As for the politics of the show, while it made headlines, Allen says it's part of a bigger plot line. This just happened to have a point of view. It's an aspect of the show he appreciates the writers adding in. I adore the point of view of the, some of those writers. They're very middle, philosophical. I'm a phil, uh, philosophy major, and I love the oh, the larger view comedy that both sides would laugh at. Yeah, and that's exactly what it is. Here's the thing with Murphy Brown, and I said this earlier. Uh, it, it, we, we did we did a stream on this. Is Murphy Brown missed the plot? You became preachy. In the end, Last Man Standing, a little bite of it, but the rest of it was just interesting and entertaining. You entertained, the other one preached. People don't care if you could do something like this as long as they're entertained by it. And they weren't with Murphy Brown. They weren't. And they didn't forget that. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. Car Shield. Now, I've got mine. You get yours. Extended vehicle protection from Car Shield is important for you and your car and for the, well, just the thought process of what if something happens to my car? Take it in. That check engine light goes on. Next thing you know, I don't have a warranty and I'm having to figure out how I pony up $1,500 or $2,000 to get this car fixed. That's where Car Shield comes in. If you ca- get Car Shield, the entire process of fixing your car for a cover repair is so easy. 24 7 roadside assistance, a rental car for free while your car's in the shop, and you choose the shop. They get them paid directly. Car Shield is easy. Easy. You can save yourself thousands. Get it today. Call 800 Car 6100. 800 Car 6100. Use code Benson or go to carshield.com. Carshield.com. Code Benson saves you 10%. You're absolutely going to love it. They're amazing. They've treated me well. They'll treat you well as they really will. It's incredible. And the, oh, just the thought process of not having to worry about the what ifs. That's that's worth it alone. Carshield.com. Code Benson. Deductible may apply. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. C H A D B E N S O N. It's the Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. Independent in thoughts and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. I want it to be comprehensive. I actually think it's a good thing for Judge Kavanaugh. I think it's actually a good thing. Not a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. Now, with that being said, I'd like it to go quickly. 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 Trump right there. And by the way, over the weekend, I've got, uh, I bought some hilarious masks. <laughs> These giant Trump heads at the Halloween store. It's awesome. Uh, quickly. What does quickly mean? And that's the big thing. What is quickly? That, that's what everybody wants to know. Quickly. How do we do it quickly? How do we do it click, quickly? We need quickly, quickly, quickly. But the left, they don't really want quickly. I think we know that. They want this thing to drag out for as long as possible. And, you know, they said a week in, in a narrowed scope, meaning, hey, we're going to look at Judge Kavanaugh. We're going we're, we're, we're to look at the allegations. Now, it's already changing. For for the Dems, because now it's about his drinking as 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 a high schooler and a college person, because he wasn't honest about his drinking. And his friends come out and say, well, he could have drank. He drank a lot. I saw him get drunk, you know, a lot. I mean, who I mean, again, you sit back and you're like, Ugh. I just feel like, how do we get to this point? But a week from now is what Flake wanted. And who knows what's going to happen now? They've already talked to his buddy, Mark Judge, but it's not quite finished yet. Apparently, there's more that needs to be done in that interview. What are the chances that we are going to be in exactly the same place a week from now? There's a chance, and we knew that, and and some of our colleagues said that. We'll be back here one week from now. It'll be worse. There will be other outrageous allegations that come forward. The FBI will talk to people that won't want to talk anymore. Uh, We won't be any better off. 
there is a chance that that will happen. I, I, I do think that we can make progress. I don't know if we're going to make progress in a week, and I don't know what's going to happen from here, how it goes, where it goes, how it gets to where it's going to get to. Uh, and that's why scope and and putting certain things as far as what you can and can't do, where you can and can't go, is vitally important. It is vitally important. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh I think the backup plan is pretty simplistic. I think they know that we got to hold on to the Senate because we're going to have to try to run somebody else through here. And if we hold on to the Senate, maybe even pick up a seat or two, this is going to be no big deal. This is going to be no big deal. And it's it's sad that we we saw a woman who, you know, I don't care what anybody says, right? The, in, the interceptor or any of these other things, I don't care what anybody said. There is an issue here with how this lady's name got out there, right? And it, and we know what that is, right? Turning around, Diane Feinstein goes, did you guys leak it? Did anybody leak it? Right? Because I think she sounds a lot like Gilbert Godfrey, but not as funny. And they're like, no. See, I told you guys it didn't happen that way. And they're like, oh, we believe you. I'm sorry. This lady's name got out there because you threw her out there. You threw her under the bus. Because you needed somebody to slow and or stop the bus down. So the best way to do it was to find a sacrificial lamb and throw her out there. And you absolutely did. This is the most despicable process I've ever seen. And we're going to get to the bottom of what they did on the other side. We'll see. We will see. Lindsey Graham, man, he's uh, he's spitting some truth, right? That's an urban word of the day, spitting truth. He is. He's bringing some facts. So we'll see what takes place. We're going to see what takes place. Uh, Mitch McConnell uh, is, uh, well, he's being Mitch, baby. The Democratic leader and the ranking Democrat on the committee both said recently that an FBI investigation can be completed in less than a week. But, Mr. President, I'd bet almost anything that after it runs its course in the next few days... We will then be treated to a lecture, a lecture, that anything short of a totally unbounded fishing expedition of indefinite duration is too limited or too arbitrary or somehow insufficient. We all know that's coming. If you listen carefully, Mr. President, you can practically hear the sounds of the Democrats moving the goalposts. Yeah, yeah, and and they are, and they've moved the goalposts with everything, but I just find that interesting because... Uh, they're already moving the goalposts. Now it's he's not told the truth about how much he drank or didn't drink. That's where we're at now. We're going to judge people on some sort of moral high ground that we're all going to get our moral high horse. I'm I, Look, based on whose morals? I had a lot of friends that partied in high school and college. I've never had a drink in my life. Should I be able to judge them for that? I've never tasted alcohol. I've never had a smoke in my life. I've never done a drug in my life. Should I be able to get on some sort of special extra high horse? Well, it, it says to his judgment. If that's the way we're going to start judging people, we're screwed. Maybe we should. That way we have nobody in Washington and we can just all kind of do our own thing. Chad, that is just wrong. No, it's not. It's not wrong. But that's how the goalposts are being changed right now. They're moving from here to there. And now we've got another week of this. And and look, I from from the first day when this happened and this came out, I said to you guys what? There are three people in particular, three people that will pay that, that will that will play out this entire process and their votes are the only one that matters. I don't know how it will end. The jury in this case consists of three senators, Jeff Flake, Lisa Murkowski, and Susan Collins. Uh, if they believe uh, that uh, Judge Kavanaugh should be elevated to the Supreme Court, it will happen. That's just a fact. Numbers count. Yeah, and they have the numbers, but those numbers are vitally important. There's a few other ones. There's some red state Democrats that that potentially, like a Joe Manchin, who may side, especially if we get through this and there doesn't seem to be anything that may come over, but by and large, it's them. And that's what all of this was. That's why the whole thing now is it's about his drinking. Because if we could show that he was a really bad drunk in high school, that we show that he could black out and that he may not remember anything, and that that's the way. It's still going to be a he said, she said thing. That's what this is going to be. He said, she said. I don't think there's going to be anything else. And 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 you you got to look at somebody like Dr. Ford and feel she something happened to her. 
And there's a great article this weekend about how both of them can be telling the truth. Meaning they went through an experience and maybe they experienced it differently. Maybe he wasn't there. Maybe he was drunk and he was there and he doesn't remember. Maybe she got it wrong and it's not him because a lot of times we say we're 100% true. Sure, it's not it. And that they can be telling the truth and wrong. But she went through something. She got thrown to the wolves. His life, it's not about him, right? It could be anybody. It's not you, Kavanaugh. It could be anybody. It's only about stopping you. The ends justify the means. That's it. The ends justify the means. So they're going to continue forward with this. And I don't know where it's going to go. I really, really don't know. I mean, what I do know is that, you know, uh, you, you look at what's going on with the investigation and there's going to be a week or so. How many people they are actually going to do it? Blumenthal's already saying, you know, Blumenthal lied. Not a shocker. Uh, we'll get to that. But, you know, he said that he's come out and said, oh, the scope, they're being handcuffed and straight jacketed. There's no way they can do this. And and we want this demand. We are demanding that 23 separate individuals be interviewed as part of this investigation. These 23 individuals have relevant knowledge to corroborate the credible allegations made by these survivors. Just now, this is a guy who Trump we over the weekend tweeted at him and has been going on and on. And it does make you laugh. Look at Blumenthal. He lied about Vietnam. He didn't just say, hey, I went to Vietnam. No, no. For 15 years, he said he was a war hero. He fought in Da Nang province. We call him Da Nang Richard. Da Nang. That's his nickname. Da Nang. (laughs) He didn't, by the way. He got five deferments. (laughs) But he did say that. And that's the funny thing. And nobody's calling him on the and and when I've seen some left wing left wing, you know, publications or things try to call him, it, they do it in a very subtle way. It's like the same thing they do with Cory Booker and what he wrote about his experience when he was grabbing a girl's boob and doing these kind of things that he shouldn't have done. Or you know, uh, Ellison it, right now is going through all this stuff in Minnesota. You know, they kind of ignore it or they they gloss over it really quick, never wanting to look in the mirror of their own warts and and stuff. Oh God, that's this is this is what politics has become. It's become a weird, uncomfortable, bizarre place where it, it's it's nasty and like Jeff Flake. I mean, I while not a huge fan of Jeff Flake, I feel bad for the guy because he's getting completely destroyed. But he's come out and said if he wasn't running for re-election, if he was running for re-election, if he was out there running again, he probably couldn't have done this. But he wasn't running because he's going to be running for 2020, but it's hard to run when you're Eeyore because he's always so sad. That's my biggest problem with him. And the other thing is behind the scenes, there was all this stuff at work because other senators like Collins and Murkowski is like, eh, we're not going to vote for this guy unless we get a, a, maybe a more comprehensive look into him. And so in doing that, he really had no choice. And he wouldn't have passed the smell test come a floor vote. So it's tough. It is. It's tough. But this whole place is just, it's wacky. It's its its like, it's bad reality TV show. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. My pillow is amazing. Your pillow will be as well. Buy one, get one free. Free, you say, Chad. Tell me more. Tell me about what it's like when you sleep on your my pillow. Simple. So I get on and I lay down on my bed and my head hits the, and that's what it's like. I'm, ooh. And it's amazing. It is incredible. Last night, the winds and the rains came. I was like, I'm going to sleep like a baby. And I did. Oh, tell me more, Chad. What else can we do? Just sleep. Get your my pillow. It's going to help you with your health. Yeah, little things go a long way. The, the more you sleep, the better you feel, the better it is for weight, your blood pressure, heart health, all of that stuff. Study after study after study show it. That's what my pillow is all about. 100% machine washable and dryable, made in the USA, backed by a 10 year warranty. And here's a great thing. You don't need a prescription to sleep this well. What, what? You just need to call 800-944-4975. Or go to MyPillow.com. Use promo code Benson. You're going to get two MyPillows for the price of one. Whoa. Most comfortable pillow. Yes. Better night's rest. Yes. MyPillow.com. 
Promo code Benson or 800-944-4975. Buy one, get one free. Use promo code Benson. MyPillow.com. Promo code Benson. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. C-H-A-D-B-E-N-S-O-N. It's Chad Benson Show. While pointless pundits ponder what was, Chad wisely wonders, what's next? I got boys and I got girls. And when I see what's going on right now, it's scary for all things. I mean, I wouldn't want who my... You, who are you scared most for, your sons yeah, or your daughter? I mean, right now, I'd say my son. Oh, Donald Trump Jr., come on. It's the Me Too movement. You should be afraid for your daughters. That's it. You should be absolutely afraid. Of course, she's taking the heat for saying this. The other problem is that for the people who are real victims of these things, when it is so obviously political in cases like this, it really diminishes the real claims. Which I think is very true, but you just... yeah. Read the room. Every once in a while, you got to just read the room. That's what I think. I think that's a lost art. I think that is very much a lost art thing where you can look around and you got to like, okay, I can read the room here. What There is something like comics will understand that. Comics will get that. They'll read a room and go, you know what? I can do a little bit of this here. I can go a little bit further here. You know, bands, I think, will, will get the same thing. They get a feeling from the crowd. And, and... I think sometimes for politicians, they're always trying to read the room and they're always trying to be on their best. Sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. And then the Me Too thing, you got to watch. You're going to take a a hammer for it. Look, and I worry, too. I've said it over and over again. I'm raising an eight-year-old son who is my world. But quite frankly, I do worry about him in this day and age of all you know it just takes one accusation or it takes one of this or you did a little bit to this. And, you know, in in a day and age where you, you have kids at school. Right? Like, I got a call a couple years ago because two little girls were chasing him and they tried to kiss him when he was like in first grade. And they're like, what do you want us to do about this? Like, he wasn't in trouble. Like, I'm like, what are you talking about? Get him a room. I don't know. I mean, that's stupid. They're being kids. But that's the weirdness, right? You point your finger at a kid when you're, when you're if you're a kid. Uh oh, was your finger loaded? How dare you? And then you got to go to sensitivity training and all this stuff like that. I mean, that's just the insanity of it all. That is just the absolute insanity of, of this. I sit back and I sit here and go, wow. But you do have to read the room. You have to learn how to read the room. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Still, a lot of you are, 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 are texting and tweeting about Kavanaugh. And, you know, people say, Chad, you're in the alt middle. You're independent. What do you think about it? Look, I think that both of them gave powerful, powerful statements. Uh, I do believe something happened to her. Do I believe it was him? No, I think it should let it play itself out. I got zero problem with that. I know a lot of people do. We should just vote him in already. It doesn't work that way. I don't know how many times I have to explain to people the way it works, right? The, the way it works is you need these votes, Flake, Collins, Murkowski. If you don't have them. Well, we could vote. You don't get to take their votes away and just vote for the sake of it. They may vote no, and then he's dead in the water, and then what? Well, how do we make them vote? Well, they want this, and you're going to get this. And I don't know if there's going to be any, anything that comes out a- at the end of this. I don't think there is. I, I think in the end that, that, that what we have now is kind of what we have, which is you're going to have to figure out for yourself. And will they get a little bit more time? I don't know. But also remember... That this isn't one of those things where the FBI is going to come out and say, uh, you're guilty. This is not a criminal investigation, the same way that the proceeding was not a criminal proceeding. And that means that they can't subpoena witnesses. They can't force people to answer their questions. They're not necessarily going to draw conclusions. Yeah. It's Dan Abrams right there, who we just absolutely love when he's on Live PD. Uh He's right. So it's not like you're going to we're not going to get anything super. Rachel Mitchell, who was the woman that was asking questions, she put out her little thing uh, and it basically said. Look, there's no prosecutor in the world that would carry forward a case like this. You're going on flimsy evidence at best. He said she said she said he said you, you, you couldn't draw any kind of real conclusion that this person was guilty of whatever that she was alleging that took place that day and that it, she, that he was the one that perpetrated it. So nobody would move forward in a situation like this. But that doesn't matter. Again, it's not about Kavanaugh. 
It could have been anybody. You could put Mickey Mouse up there. Whoa! They would have accused him of rape. Mickey, did you do something to Minnie 23 years ago? I did not. Didn't matter. It's about just that. Are you kidding me? I'm going to come after you, Kamala Harris. You better watch it. Ha, ha, ha. Mickey would have been all pissed off, too, up in this. You guys better watch out. You better not cry. Ha, ha. I'm coming. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. Hey. Ryan Salam is going to join us next. We're going to talk about immigration and his story and why he doesn't want open borders. It's Chad Benson Show. The Chad Benson Show. Independent in thoughts and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. Immigration, always interesting. Uh, And if you're on the right side of the aisle, you're always deemed and being called everything from a xenophobic to a racist. Joining us now is somebody who has his own story. He is the executive editor of the National Review, and he's got a new book out called Melting Pot or Civil War, A Son of Immigrants Makes the Case Against Open Borders. Raihan Salam joins us. And, And first of all, Am I right in saying that every time that a person on the right makes a, a, a some sort of cogent argument about, hey, why we should have a country and, and, and somewhat close borders that everybody's deemed a, a xenophobe or whatever they want to call us? Yep, that sounds about right to me. Uh, people are very hostile uh, when you say that, hey, you know, people want a controlled, managed immigration system. And uh, you are a... Again, son of an immigrant, you're uh, what we would call here in the politically correct world, a person of color, and you're making a case against having open borders. And and it's funny because I look I, 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 as I'm reading the book, as I'm looking at this, all of it seems to make pretty much common sense, you know, like, OK, that seems like a really common sense thing. When you talk to people out there, uh, especially people on the left, when you go into a morning show or something like that, how do they come at you? Because the, the narrative is, uh, you know, if you're normally the white privilege guy, they come after you. But it's different for you. It really depends on whether or not someone has preconceived notions about you. If they've already decided that you're the enemy, then they're not going to listen to anything you have to say. If you approach it in a certain way... When you say, hey, look, we all have these things we're concerned about, and then let's build up from there. That, in my experience, works a little bit better, but there are frankly some people who are going to be opposed to you no matter what, no matter how carefully you talk about it, no matter how compassionate or generous or decent you come across, they're just out to destroy. So it really depends on the folks you're talking to in particular. Talking to Raihan Salam, who is the uh, executive director, uh, editor of National Review's new book out called Melting Pot or Civil War, Son of Immigrants Makes the Case Against Open Borders. Let's talk about some of the things. You know, one of the things you talk about is, is and something I've been screaming for a long time. If I want to get mad at anybody for, for immigrating into our country, especially in particular illegally, that's what we're really talking about, is at some point in time, we have to start pointing the figures at uh, fingers at bad governments who have allowed their their corrupt systems to fail their own people and they're looking for you know a place where they can go and make a living for themselves places like mexico and guatemala el salvador and elsewhere and i don't think people understand that this is a hugely important point what we're looking at is a comprehensive failure on the part of many different actors so the you know it's not just about attacking immigrants it's really about the fact that we allowed this to happen and we've allowed our systems to break down in service to certain interest groups including employers who are unscrupulous and who take advantage of this broken system you know, you talk about assimilation, which to me is vitally important. I, I have always said this is, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough to live around the world. I played soccer, did all kinds of stuff, lived in Europe for, for almost a decade, on and off. And I've always said it, it, how somebody assimilates is really going to – your American experience is going to be based on that. And assimilation is key. If you want to be a part of the culture, America's open arm for you. If you just want to come here and be you here and not really enjoy all of the stuff America is, it, it, it's not going to work. 
you've really hit the nail on the head. This is the big issue. People talk about assimilation as though it's all one single thing. And the truth is that we're seeing two different kinds of assimilation in America right now. You have some folks who are assimilating into the mainstream, oftentimes because they have the language skills, they're able to enter the middle class, they are prepared for it in a way. Then you have other folks who are oftentimes great decent, hardworking people, but they find that they're being incorporated into a marginalized minority. They're living in segregated communities. They feel locked out of the middle class. And you might decide as an individual, hey, I'm the one who moved. Okay, fair enough. Not a big deal. You know, I decided to do it myself. But then for that person's child, it's a very different story. When you're raised in that environment where you're assimilating into this kind of underclass group, that becomes really tough. And that's what we're ignoring right now. We're ignoring the fact that we're not just talking about one single thing called immigration. We're talking about different experiences depending on skills, language ability, and much else. Talking to Raihan Salam, uh, Melting Pot of Civil War's new book, A Son of Immigrant Makes the Case Against Open Borders. So we look at, like I look at immigration, I think we've got to start thinking outside the box. I would love to see us do something kind of European-based in the sense of if you're part of NAFTA or whatever this new thing is, maybe there's a, a, a lot freer and ease to move in and out of countries where you can come here. We know you're here, essentially, for lack of a better term, as a booty call. You want to make the money and leave, rather than this fake thing that we're trying to do now which I just don't think is working around. I just think we're failing miserably at it, and neither side really wants to do anything about immigration in a real way. I respectfully disagree with you there. I see where you're coming from, and I do think that there are some ways um, you know, to uh, address the system in, in more sensible ways. My concern is having this kind of guest worker migration and freeing that up creates other problems down the road. Because let's say you're here as a temporary guest worker for you know, three years, five years. What happens is you form roots, you form relationships, you start a family, right? And then you say, okay, now we're going to enforce the rules at this point down the line. I don't think that's really going to work in a society that values civil liberties. Singapore has a guest worker system that works decently well, but Singapore is willing to deport guest workers who become pregnant. And that's something that I really don't think Americans have a stomach for. And that's why I think allowing that kind of temporary migration, you have to be really careful about it. You have to be willing to really enforce it on the back end. So I see your point. And I do think that, you know, for example, you can make it easier for retirees in the United States to live in Mexico. You can make it easier for professionals uh, you know, who are earning a certain income to make that kind of movement. But I think that moving too far in that direction could have downsides. See, what you're saying, it's like everything else, though, with government, right? It, it's it, The idea may be good, and you might make this amazing, you know, you come up with this incredible idea, but the reality is, is when we go to put it into, ac- into action, we never follow through with the way that things are, and then it becomes more about feelings than facts, and that's where we run into real issues. I would go even further than you, Chad. There are a lot of times when people make an argument for a certain policy without ever intending to follow through. In a way, it's almost like a fake policy. We're going to say this is going to be a temporary policy, but we're not doing any of the things we need to do in order to actually make it temporary. I see that a lot in policy debates, and I frankly think it's pretty dishonest and misleading. Well, that's government, isn't it? That's politics, right? You just say something. Yeah, I, All you do is say something, Ron, to get, to get elected. And really, nobody cares outside of that because nobody ever holds your, you accountable for your actions. So let's talk about the immigrants. You talk about the immigrants we, we need in America, which and, – and there is there is a need for, for people, not just guest workers. You know, people are going to pick our fruits and vegetables and whatnot. But there's a lot of other skills, coding and things like that, where we're falling behind and we need those people here. How do we go about doing that in a way that is, you know – you know, I I threw the guest worker thing out there, but how do we bring people here on merit, you know, like a meritocracy, if you will? Well, it really is true that you have people who are educated in the United States, uh, who have job offers, who could absolutely support themselves, and they often find it very, very hard to get a green card, partly because there are so few green cards available to people on an employment basis. We give out green cards, the vast majority of them, to people based on whether or not they're related to someone. 
uh, whether or not you're the adult sibling of someone who is already residing in the country and much else. And my own view is that that doesn't make a ton of sense. You know, maybe you can say, okay, that could be a point in your favor, but that shouldn't be the only thing we consider. We should also take into account whether or not you have the language skills, whether or not you have a job offer that pays you well enough to ensure that you're not going to rely on the safety net. I think that would make a lot more sense. And by the way, it would actually be more predictable and rational. People who find our system totally crazy and maddening would really appreciate that too. It would be better for Americans. It would be better for people who are trying to see, hey, what are my guideposts? What's being expected of me if I want to live in the United States? What is what was your what was your life like? I mean, you grew up you grew up in New York. So, what is your life like? You, you're obviously a son of immigrants. So, you, they, they they come here. What was their assimilation like? What was your assimilation like in in, in into the culture of America? Well, in my case, I was very lucky, partly because I was part of a really small group, part of a really small community. So when I went to school, the vast majority of my friends, they came from different backgrounds. They came from all over the place. And we spoke English to one another, and we just grew up you know, in American culture, uh, almost by necessity. But then when you have folks who are growing up in isolated, segregated, enclave communities, it can be a really different story. You find yourself almost trapped in this community, and you find yourself alienated and separated from Americans from other backgrounds. You know, that's an extreme case, but it really does happen in some corners of the country. And my fear is that that might be even more the case in the future if we don't adopt a more controlled and managed system. When I look at everything, uh, my big fear is, and everybody say, you know, you're a xenophobe or you're this, that, and the other people scream stuff because that's all they know how to do, is that America, we, we have a culture in America, and for whatever reason, the people on the left in particular are afraid of our culture because they only look at the bad of our culture and not the good. And I always say that you go around the globe, people love America, people that come here. And I grew up in a time in an era where kids in my school when I was in junior high had escaped Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge, and they embraced the culture. They loved America. They believed in the American dream if more than most Americans. And yet we can't talk about that in this day and age because the minute you bring something up like that, it's uh, you're a xenophobe. You're trying to kill other people's co culture. The American flag makes people uncomfortable. It's insane. How do we get around that? It's really tough because basically right now, when people advance those messages, uh, this idea that the melting pot is some terrible thing, you get rewarded for it. You know, these are ideas that, you know, members of the elite have embraced. And that's something that I personally find pretty scary because if you don't have a melting pot story, if you don't have a unifying story about all that Americans do have in common, that's where you get this incredible divisiveness in which you pit one group against another. So I agree with you. I think that's a big concern. And I think that that's why I want an immigration system that is more sensible, rational, and balanced, because that is what allows immigrants to really become a full part of American culture. If if you were to have one thing you can do on immigration, just one thing, yeah, they come to you and they said, uh, Rahan, you have one thing that we're gonna we're gonna allow you to put this in here. What would that one thing be? I think we should adopt a point system in which we select immigrants based on their actual qualities, what it is they're bringing to the table, rather than purely basing it on family ties. I think that would be a huge, huge improvement over the status quo. And I think people would feel a lot better about immigration if they knew that folks uh, are taking into account uh, the contributions people are making and whether the immigration system is actually in the national interest and in the interest of all american workers last question appreciate you coming on today uh and this one we'll, we'll just quickly go off topic what do you make of the craziness when it comes to uh, the whole kavanaugh and everything going on right now well, I'll just say that Brett Kavanaugh is a guy who uh, has always been in liberal institutions. He's had friendships with liberals. He was literally hired as a lecturer at Harvard Law School by Elena Kagan, who was appointed to the Supreme Court by President Obama. He's someone who's always played by the rules, always tried to make friendships. And it's really striking to see how much opposition there was to him long before any of these abuse allegations came to light. We're just in we're through the looking glass. We're in this frighteningly partisan environment and uh and I, I just don't know where we go from here no me either me either melting pot or civil war son of immigrants makes the case against open borders uh Rayhan salam hope to have you on again appreciate you coming on today great book for anybody out there who really wants to understand things thank you so much and uh, look forward to uh, talking to you again thanks for having me chad
Thank you. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter, C-H-A-D-B-E-N-S-O-N. His book is very interesting. And the assimilation part, I, I, I don't know how many times I have to tell people this. To me, that's the most important part when you become uh, somebody who comes here. The reason they're coming here is because America is America, not because you get to be you. Just in a different place. And I think that people who embrace stuff like that and understand the greatness of what we have to offer, there's a reason they want to come here. They see something different than most of us. I think a lot of us, we've lost the sight. We can't see the, the forest through the trees. And it, it really is interesting. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. It's the Chad Benson Show. Running with scissors sounds great compared to this. Say woo! So, producer Phil, can you do me a quick favor? Can you remind the audience what happens uh, in nature? Nature will mess you up. Mess you up. Case in point, Escondido, California. Out in the water for over 30 minutes, uh, and I hear uh, screaming. I thought it was... You know, someone who caught some big bugs and is enthusiastic. So, you know, woo, good for you. And uh, he kept going. And then I realized that he was yelling, uh, I, I got bit, help, help, help. And he's not even swimming towards shore. He's just swimming towards, you know, our group. Uh, once we get him on the kayak, we can really see uh, what happened. And uh, his whole clavicle is ripped open. You could see, uh, you know, the ball and socket joint, everything. Yeah, a 13 year old was tack. Uh, a few things. That happened. First of all, I don't know how many times you hear these stories. And you, if anybody watches Shark Week, you don't go in the ocean at dusk or dawn. You don't. That's when sharks are out doing their shark things, whatever it is. Hey, we got shark business. We're doing stuff. And uh, but this was very interesting. So he bites the 13 year old and takes a huge chunk. He's in critical condition. He bites the 13 year old really, really bad. And they get him over to the kayak. But the shark's not done. Yeah, so we throw him up on there, and we're telling him he's going to be okay, he's going to be all right. We got help. I yell at everyone to get out of the water. There's a shark in the water. Tell uh, everyone on the beach. I was screaming at him to uh, get on his cell phone. Uh, so someone ran up here and called uh, paramedics and police. And, yeah, luckily we got him out of the water because once we threw him up on the kayak and started heading in, that's when uh, I looked back, and a uh, shark was behind the kayak. Yeah, and he was also lucky that the two guys that were there that rescued him also happened to be first responders that were able to even give him a chance. And then, of course, it's, uh, why did this happen? One of the things that we are seeing, not just in California, but also on the East Coast, is that shark populations are increasing, which means they're going to be interacting with people more and more because there are more people going in the ocean than ever before. Absolutely. And we got to remember, too, why they're in certain areas is because for years they killed sharks, they culled sharks. And so when they call them, they're gone. And what happens? The pinnipeds, they reproduce massive. And now it's a feeding frenzy. And they can go there and, and have their choice of any snack they want. And every once in a while, they make a mistake. But, you know, surfers were out there today, man. The odds of it happening again at this beach this soon after are minimal minimal bro it's just not gonna happen hey you know what you go in nature sometimes it will mess you up just putting it out there three two three five three eight twenty four twenty three dollar shave club you see me streaming every day tv all the stuff that i do why i want to look beautiful right well i can't but thanks to dollar shave club i can be well not horrible i look smell and feel fantastic and you will too Join today. Simple and easy. Five bucks. Free shipping. After that stuff, ships at normal price. Hair care products. Check, check. Uh, beard oil. Check. Hand lotion. Check. Uh, body uh, wash. Check. Shampoo, conditioner. Check. Toothpaste, toothbrush. Check. And of course, razors. Absolutely. They got everything you need to look, smell, and feel fantastic. Top shelf ingredients. Not going to break your budget. Five bucks. Daily essential starter set. You start right there. Right? You choose any one of these, get a feel for them, and then after that, enjoy what the club is going to do for you. DollarShaveClub.com slash Chad. DollarShaveClub.com slash Chad. DollarShaveClub.com slash Chad. Five bucks. You're going to look, feel, smell absolutely amazing. DollarShaveClub.com slash Chad. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. Like us on the old Facebook, Chad Benson Show. Also, check us out at Chad Benson Show TV on YouTube as well. It's the Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show.
independent in thought, and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. I want it to be comprehensive. I actually think it's a good thing for Judge Kavanaugh. I think it's actually a good thing. Not a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. Now, with that being said, I'd like it to go quickly. Quickly. Well, we'll see if it's going to go quickly or not. Very interesting, uh, this whole investigation. And you know what's funny is you're hearing all of, so you've got the right and the left fighting, already over fighting over the investigation. How should it go? When will it end? What can they do? What can't they do? Dick Blumenthal. The White House seems to be micromanaging and straitjacketing an investigation that must uncover the facts and evidence necessary to determine whether Brett Kavanaugh is qualified to sit on the highest court in the land. No, that's not what they do. They're investigating a situation. You guys are supposed to find out if he's qualified to do the job. He could be a wonderful human being with nothing hanging over him and not qualified to sit on the highest court in the land. That's your job. Are they straight jacketing, micromanaging it? Potentially. But they're looking at a situation, especially the president, where he's going, okay, look at the Mueller investigation. Where we started and where we are, two different things. It was all about collusion, the Russians, and all of this stuff. Nobody, and that's the thing that he's so angry about when it comes to this entire investigation, when it comes to him, is the fact that There isn't any restraint. There wasn't any parameters put on it. There wasn't a lane it was told to stay in, so it gave Mueller free room room to roam. So what he's trying to say is, look, we need to put it in a situation where, look, you can investigate A, B, and C, and that's it, right? That's it, A, B, and C. We don't want you out there investigating, well, what did he do as a, you know, even though there wasn't rape here, maybe he had too much to drink here. Or maybe he, you know, he got into it in, in a fist fight with a friend. And uh, I mean, th- that's the insanity of where they're worried about it going. And I completely understand that. Uh, and I think that, you know, there should be parameters on all these investigations, because if they're just going to investigate for the investigate's sake, they could be there forever and a day. And what they could eventually catch him on or whatever they're trying to do could have nothing to do with anything. And that's what the left is hoping for. So, yes. In the end, it's about giving him parameters. It's about putting in a situation. And even Flake, right, even Jeff Flake, who everybody hates right now. And I'm going to tell you something about Jeff Flake. There's a lot of you out there that can't stand Jeff Flake. I got a lot of, of, you know, how horrible he is. He's a rhino. I am telling you this now. There is more than meets the eye that people will find out later on down the line about why he did what he did. If you think that they were going to ram it through and that they had this done and all they had to do was vote yes without any kind of thing... Guess again, there were other people that had concerns on the right side of the aisle that would not have voted for him without this. So it was this or nothing. Period. Case closed. This or nothing. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. Uh, Last night, Jeff Flake uh, was on 60 Minutes with uh, Chris Coombs talking about uh, just this entire situation and, uh, you know, Kavanaugh and, and how he thought it went. I have to say that when I heard him, I heard someone who I hoped I would sound like if I had been unjustly accused. And to see his family behind him. And uh, it was it was anger. Uh, but um, but if I were unjustly accused, that's how I would feel as well. And I, I, as it went on, um, I think his interaction with some of the members uh, was a little too sharp. Yeah, I, I get that. But he's saying what nobody he's he, his common sense enough. And, and again, a lot of people out there can't stand him. I think he's running for office at some point in time and a bigger office. And that office is in, in, uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue. Yeah, I think he's going to run for president. He even said he probably couldn't do this if 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 reelection was in his future. He probably couldn't have done this. So this gave them the freedom to do this. But also, you know, there were other there were other factors that were at work behind the scenes. But the interesting thing is, is, is everybody is like how angry he was, how mad he was, how how testy he was. How dare he do this? How dare he act the way he did? How dare he be angry at something like this? 
I was really stunned uh, by how we acted at that hearing. This is a basically a job interview for the highest court of the land. Uh, her testimony was compelling, incredible. Well, both accounts can't be true. And so one, one idea here is that he simply was drinking more than he was saying over this time period and that he didn't remember what happened. And so I was just simply trying to get at that and... That's Amy Klobacher from uh, uh, Minnesota. And so that's one idea, right? That is one idea. It's a job offer. Well, I mean, it's a job interview. I've never gone to a job interview where they looked at me and go, so I hear you're a rapist. And these people over here who may hire you or may not hire think you're a rapist. Think you're an alcoholic rapist. Think that you, you, you put people in positions to be raped. As a child, that was your job. You were like uh, the front man. It's like the movie Taken, right? You're at the airport and you're 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 trying to get people to share rides with you, and then you tell your friends, "Hey, come on over here. I drugged them all up. Come rape them." No. So how how would how would you feel, right? How would anybody feel? Any reasonable, sane human being, man or woman, black or white, gay or straight, would be pissed off, would be angry. And if you're sitting there for days, and we think about this for a second. He had days of being called all kinds of things. He had days of seeing his name dragged through the mud. He had days of sitting there stewing and being angry. And finally, he had his chance to come forward and defend himself. And do I think at times he was a little bit harsh? Uh, I can understand that. Yeah, he probably would. But couldn't any reasonable, sane human being understand that? He had exchanges with Senator Feinstein, with Senator Klobuchar, with others that uh, I thought went over a line. Um, he was clearly belligerent, um, aggressive, angry. Yeah, as anybody would. Now, at the same time, things you don't hear about. So I was just simply trying to get at that and really couching it in the fact that I had alcoholism in my own family. My dad, who's 90 now, struggled with it throughout his life and finally got treatment and is sober and got help from AA. And so I was actually trying to get at the truth. And sure. so that's why I was mm-hmm. stunned by how he answered it. But then, of course, he... He later apologized. Yeah, but you're trying to diagnose him as an alcoholic. Minus me, I can name no people I've ever met who didn't party as a, as a high schooler. Producer Phil, you and I are the same age. You're nearly the same age as our friend over here as I am, uh, Judge Kavanaugh. Did you maybe at times have a few beverages of the adult nature when you were in high school? Um, on the advice of counsel, I choose not to answer that question. That's a yes. (laughs) There you go. There you go. Right? But that's what we're getting at. Well, you know, I've got friends who are alcoholics. My dad was an alcoholic. (laughs) That's, That's the craziness of it all. But this was never about and still continues to be never about this person and his well-being, or Dr. Ford and her well-being, this has only to do with the fact that they want to stop him at all costs by any means necessary. That's it. No more. By any means necessary. We'll see what happens. Oh, God. And I saw people over the weekend hammering, oh, you know, it's because he's white. You're like, what? Yeah, it's because he's an angry white man. What does him being white have anything to do with this? I'm sure if you accused a black man of rape and doing all of these kind of things, I would expect them to be angry as well and push back. Or a woman. I would expect her. Let's just say he doesn't. All right, for the sake of arguments, he doesn't get through this process. And then they go, uh, Amy uh, Coney Barrett is the one they, they come after next. And they go after her hardcore. I would expect her to push back. And if you call her a child molester, let's just say, right? Like, this is hypothetical here. Do you think she's going to be pissed and angry? Right? If you say, hey, I hear you bite the heads off chickens. That's what I heard. And that at night you do satanic worship in your house. And that you, uh, you know, you mainline uh, whatever. Do you think that maybe there would be a pushback and anger? I'm just curious. I think everybody has a right to be pissed off and angry. That sometimes everybody has a right to push back. And I would expect anybody to be accused of anything to push back in that direction. Don't care what it is. You should. You should be pissed. You should be angry. Doesn't mean it's the right. Well, it's a job. It's a job interview. I've never been in a job interview 
where they've uh, they've tried to destroy your life. And I'm still not. I've still not been in that job interview yet. Like, hey, we're calling you in, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna ask you some questions. Oh, and by the way, half the room is gonna hate you and accuse you of doing horrible things because <laughs> they don't want you to get the job. Three two three five three eight twenty four twenty three at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. It's the Chad Benson Show. You go, boy. This isn't about right or left. This is just about right and wrong. Right, you are, Chad. Chad. The Chad Benson Show. Now. One year later, after all those shots were fired and still why Stephen Paddock carried out the attack is a mystery. Las Vegas Sheriff Joe Lombardo has a theory that Paddock was angry about losing money to gambling and had mental issues. Without a manifesto or even a note to answer questions, the totality of the information that has been gathered leaves us to only make an educated guess as to the motives of Stephen Paddock. While local police have closed their investigation, the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit is still working on a psychological report on Paddock due out later this year. You think about it, we're a year. It's exactly one year today, the anniversary of that horrific day. And we as human beings, we want to know for ourselves, right? Like, could, could we be the monster? Could we be that? The guy seemed to have everything. He had money. He, he, he seemed to have everything. What happened? What was the trigger? And this was the weirdest of all the weirds. We see a lot of these things where, you know, he was bullied or, or you know, he lost his job and he was angry at the world or whatever. You know, this was none of that. This was none of that. So not putting a... Any kind of, 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 you know, just your, your, your thumb right on it saying, this is it right here. I found it. I found it. It, it freaks people out. It does. Because inherently we want to solve a problem. And that problem is, is, is what was this? How did this happen? You know, how, how did this happen? How, how, how did we get here? What, what happened to this guy that made, because he had all these things. And, you know, it has been a year. And it is it is crazy. It is absolutely crazy. Even Trump spoke about it today. All of America is grieving for the lives lost and for the families they left behind. So to all of those families and to the people of Las Vegas, we love you. We are with you. Yeah, good. As we should be. As we should. Today, I think Vegas is going to go dark uh, today, which will be very interesting to see how that plays itself. Are they going to go completely dark? And, and you know, we've seen since then Parkland, and we've seen a few other ones since then, and uh, horrible acts, but nothing comes anywhere close to that. And still the question remains, why? And this is one of those ones where it's going to be a mystery because there was, as they said, no manifesto, nothing, nothing that can definitively point. We're just guessing at this point in time and human beings we hate that we hate guessing because this has to do with somebody who seemed to have it all and that makes us uncomfortable 323-538-2423 at chad benson show is your twitter so this weekend uh kanye was hanging out in the old saturday night live I'm at a loss for words here. Uh, Kanye West dressing up like a bottle of sparkling water last night on SNL. He was performing his first of three songs with rapper Lil Pump, who was also dressed up as a water bottle. Um, So the costumes were apparently a reference to a line in the song talking about sparkling and still water. Audience, though, seemed pretty confused. Twitter was ruthless. One person tweeting out, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if Kanye dressed up as a Teletubby. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting, right? But then... The thing that got everybody's, uh, uh, you know, if you will, their their cackles up is the fact that he talked about Trump. And in the day and age, especially in a place like New York City or San Francisco or Los Angeles or Seattle, there are places you can talk about Trump and then there are places you're not allowed to talk about Trump without fearing the wrath. What we all didn't see was that apparently he stayed on During a commercial break, he gave a pro-Trump rant, causing some in the audience to boo. There's so many times I talk to, like, a white person about this, and they say, how did you like Trump? He's racist. Well, uh, if I was concerned about racism, I would have moved out of America a long time ago. But now this (laughs) bothers me. 
You're not allowed to talk about that. How dare you? How dare you have an open mind? How dare you say anything? How dare you do something like that? And it was, uh, it was, you know, the usual Saturday Night Live stuff. They definitely went after Kavanaugh. Matt Damon played Kavanaugh. Judge Kavanaugh, are you ready to begin? Oh, hell yeah. I'm going to start at an 11. I'm going to take it to about a 15 real quick. First of all, I showed this speech to almost no one. Not my family, not my friends, not even PJ or Tobin or Squee. I wrote it myself last night while screaming into an empty bag of Doritos. (laughs) It was okay, I guess. It was all right. You know, uh, it is, uh, and it continued. And I can I can laugh at stuff like this. I know a lot of people out there get angry about it. I I just uh, first of all I rarely find any of it any sound anything Saturday Night Live does funny anymore. Uh, this wasn't awful. I'm here tonight because of a sham, a political con job orchestrated by the Clintons, George Soros, and Kathy Griffin, and Mr. Ronan Sinatra. Now I am usually an optimist. I'm a Keg is half full kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh a little bit, kids, or you cry. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. A lot of stuff still to get to. So will she or won't she? That is a big question. Midterms are coming up. This could be this is a big referendum on Trump. This is the first time that really Trump is on the ballot. And it's going to be interesting to see how that plays itself out. Not only, you know, just in, in I think, in going forward, even 2020, she said she may think about it. We'll talk about that as well. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Love hearing. Make sure you check out Chad Benson Show TV on the old YouTube. It's the Chad Benson Show. Chad Benson Show. Independent in thoughts and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. Negotiators have signed on to a rewritten North American Free Trade Agreement. Canada agreed to the new NAFTA deal, preserving the trade pact between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Sources say the final stumbling blocks were worked out. The U.S. will have greater access to Canada's dairy market, and the threatened U.S. tariffs on Canadian auto exports have been addressed. The leaders of all three countries are expected to sign the new treaty. After that, the U.S. Congress has 60 days to review and approve it. So Trump wants this done uh, ASAP, obviously, and he is touting this as a victory. One of the things he said he was going to do, and remember this, this is, you know, and he, we, we've talked about it before. Even people who are never Trumpers, right, who, who've come on here on, on more than a few occasions said, hey, you know what, uh, Ruben uh, Navarrete, who, who's come on and said, look, he's I'm a never Trumper, but these are things he's done. And he said he was going to do. Is this another one? Yeah. Canada came away with a lot as well, though. Completely intact, word for word, from the old agreement is something called Chapter 19. What does that mean? It means that Canada can go to an independent referee when it has a dispute, a trading dispute um, with the United States and does not have to subject itself to any kind of U.S. ruling that remains intact from the old deal. All in all, it, it is not a wholesale change of the agreement that was already on the table, but enough uh, for Donald Trump to claim that he's uh, basically had another victory on yet another campaign yeah, and which is true because uh, uh, that dairy farm thing for a lot of people who are dairy farmers, this was this was a big win for them, and and the Canadians get what they want as far as the auto side goes. So uh, you know, uh, Trump feels like he did a good job uh, with this, it, like everything else, and especially something like this. It remains to be seen because this is over time, right? This isn't an overnight thing. This will be an over time kind of thing. But he feels stoked about it. We have negotiated this new agreement based on the principle of fairness and reciprocity. To me, it's the most important word in trade, because we've been treated so unfairly by so many nations all over the world, and we're changing that. Yeah, and that's the way he feels, and I think a lot of people feel that way. Even some Dems are all right with it. 
Actually, you had some Democrats say, this is really amazing if he really got all of that. But by uh, tomorrow, I would suspect they'll change their tune. But that's okay. <laughs> Which is true. Trudeau. Oh, Trudeau. He seems to be pretty good, eh? Mr. Prime Minister, is it a good deal for is it a good deal for Canada? Good day for Canada. How come, sir? Good journey for Canada. How come, sir? Have you given concessions on Talk to you guys tomorrow. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Hey, it's a good day for Canada. Who wants to see me without my shirt on? Eh? So, so a somewhat win all around. So we'll see how this plays itself out. Trump needs as many victories as possible because we're heading into the midterms. And as we all know, the midterms, especially now more than ever, may be a referendum. Usually it is on who's ever in power because we like to check power in this nation, regardless of how well you're doing, because we don't like to see one side completely have complete power. This is different. And what may come with this uh, when it comes to President Trump? A president's party almost always loses seats in a midterm election. There have been like two exceptions in the last 80 years. Second, a party's prospects are generally linked to their president's approval ratings. Currently, Trump's average approval rating this past month is about two points lower than Obama in 2010 when Democrats suffered a disastrous midterm. Yeah, yeah. And that was, look, that was two points less. Here's the thing, though. Even though his approval rating and those are always skewed because you may not like the person. And a lot of that stuff is 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 how we feel about the person themselves. How do I feel about you? I may not like you, but I look around and say, well, the economy's doing OK. Uh, you know, I don't I don't like him. I don't like I, I don't approve of him. Now, the job he's doing, we may step back and that's a different story. But there are specific problems this time for Republicans. First, some 40 Republican incumbents are leaving, while only 18 Democrats have announced their retirements, and it's just easier to flip an open seat. Second, 25 House Republicans are in districts carried by Hillary Clinton two years ago, mainly in suburban districts, literally from coast to coast. Only 13 Democratic seats are in Trump-friendly districts. And it is here in suburban America where the president's approval ratings are particularly low. Hmm. There are some places he needs to worry about. And and in the big chance, hey, look, I think th- I think the Dems have a real good chance of taking back the House. The Senate still is going to be a nightmare for them. It's going to be a real issue for them. And, you know, this Kavanaugh, that's one thing that people are talking about. It's like this whole Kavanaugh thing. Does that play into a lot of this? It's in the red states where the Kavanaugh nomination may play out particularly uh, influentially. Remember, only senators, not congressmen, not House members, vote on confirmation. The feeling was that these red state Democrats might be pushed to vote for confirming Kavanaugh. The recent allegations uh, may make that differently. Also in these states, centrist Democrats are going to be pushed by their Republican opponents on immigration and on whether they embrace the policies of the more progressive left swing of the National Democratic Party. And that right there is a big, big deal because they're looking at this because, you know, I I saw over the weekend, uh, what's his name, Uh, Bannon, who was on with uh, Bill Maher, who, by the way, it was very very interesting to watch because, you know, Bill Maher said, first and foremost, this is why the Republicans win, because they'll come on my show. I don't have a problem getting people. The left won't go anywhere. But he talked about the, the, the progressive populism that is coming. And I think that's a big thing that people are looking at. Is, is there going to be a progressive wave of populism that, that I feel is, is, is actually starting to, to happen? You've got the populism that Trump has brought. And then you look over and, you've, and, and they're, they're lining up. And this lady is the one, I think, who a lot of people think is going to take charge uh, come 2020. Time's up. Time's up. It's time, it's time for women to go to Washington and fix our broken government, and that includes a woman at the top. So here's what I promise. After November 6th, I will take a hard look at running for president. I think we can do, I think we can turn this country around. That's interesting. And I think the reason she says after November 6th, because if for the sake of argument. Right. They don't get the House back and they don't get the Senate, then the thought process is. 
I, I may not have a chance at all because I've got to start running now. I have to start running now. And if they if the if they think they've got everything in the bag, they think they've got everything won. They think, hey, this is it. This is what people want. They want our progressive politics. They want this. And all of a sudden, it rolls around, and you know, people are like, yeah, you know, the independents, because the independents are going to decide this, right? The bases are the bases, but the independents are going to decide this. And they say, you know, no, we don't think so. Then she'll say, eh, I'm not going to run. She wants to know that 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 movement is happening. She wants to feel the same thing I think that Trump felt that that movement is starting to come. That here it is, and we've got the progressive populism. We've got the Ocasio Cortez. We've got the the people that are going left of the left of the left. We've got them behind us, and that this is what America wants now. We want a wholesale change. We want uh, uh, you know health care for all. We want guaranteed jobs. We want all of this stuff, and that they can sell it to the entire country. If she feels she can do it, she will. But she's not going to do it if they get their asses handed to them in November. And that it surprised her. If she's not going to do it because she knows if that doesn't happen, then there's no chance. Zero. Silch. Nada. 323-538-2423. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Love hearing from you. Uh, people are texting in about Kavanaugh. Somebody texted in and said, Chad, uh, I never had a drink and I lived in an exemplary Christian life and, and I didn't have a drink until I was 21. It's not hard to find. No, I think for a lot of people, I mean, a majority of kids, right, have had a few beverages is what I was saying. And that having a few beverages as a child and by child, I mean, you know, 17, 18, 19 just should not disqualify you from this which is what they've started to make this now is that he's some sort of alcoholic and that's and that somehow he still must be that 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 this is the issue with it it's not just that he potentially did all these things to dr blazy ford and all of these other people that he is also uh an addict and 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 or an alcoholic which i find to be ridiculous and but, but that's the way these things go that's why when they talk about what's happening when it comes to the 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 scope of which this investigation could go on they want to narrow it and keep it like hey you're here to investigate this all right you're not here to investigate if him and his friends you know partied one night after a football game and they were just hanging out and they drank a keg right you, you're not here to investigate you're here to investigate did he or didn't he do the things that he's been accused of by these women not did he have too much to drink as an underage drinker and we're going to hold him somehow accountable as if. Oh, but look at the things he wrote in the... It's funny. The other thing is, too, like somebody wrote earlier that look at the things he wrote in the book. We act as if young young men haven't said stupid things and been braggadocious when they're kids. That somehow we have to hold all of everybody to this standard that is ridiculous. Come on now. I live in a world of reality. If that's the way we're going to be, that we're going to hold these people up as we need somebody who is pious and is untouchable from ever having any kind of issues, then, you know, come on. Like, the, you're, you, it's impossible, right? It, it's virtually impossible to find anybody that is that pious, that is that. And, 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 and if you do find them, chances aren't they wanting part of any of the stuff that you're offering them. It's ridiculous. It really is. I, I just I sit here and scratch my head. Yes, we want you to be a robot all the way through. And that's the other thing. Like for, I looked at Ted Cruz. Right. I looked at Ted Cruz and I felt like everything Ted did from the time he was a child to where he was when he was running for president was so manufactured that it felt uncomfortable. But they want you to be that way. And then when you are that way, it feels disingenuous. And then it, it just it's a can't it's, it's a never win situation. Three two three five three eight twenty four twenty three at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. AMAC, incredible. Somebody wrote me over the weekend and said, "Hey, I just signed up. It really was free." I said, "It is free. If you're over the age of fifty, it's free. A year membership free. They don't even want your credit card." They were shocked by that. They're like, "I was looking at them. You're right. I mean, a lot of what I believe, they believe. Common sense immigration reform, things of that nature, Medicare reform, things of those natures that matter." And on top of that, the benefits were amazing. They're like, do you know you get all this stuff? I said, yeah, I've been preaching about it. 40% off 
SeaWorld, Legoland, Six Flags, Disneyland, Disney World, 40% off movie tickets, access to supplemental dental plans up to 60% off, retail, restaurant, travel, discounts, check, 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 check. And that's just to name a few. There are so many things that you get, and then some. So what are you waiting for? Sign up today. They don't even want your credit card. Absolutely free one-year membership. Go to amac.us forward slash Chad. No tricks, no credit card required, nothing. There's no bait and switch. It's free. You just sign up, boom. AMAC.US forward slash Chad or call 888 355 1668. That's 888 355 1668 or online at AMAC.US forward slash Chad. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter, C H A D B E N S O N. Got your useless fact of the day straight ahead. Chad Benson Show. No snowflake zone. Uninformed opinions are in danger of melting. The Chad Benson Show. Jeremy Kim would like to have another meeting. Have a meeting. You know what they did? The other day on a good network, I had one of the Yankers say, Why has President Trump given up so much? I didn't give up anything. Really? I didn't give up anything. What did I give up? I gave up nothing. Why have I given up... the only thing I gave up was I agreed to meet. Boy, we lost a lot, right? In other words, I agreed to meet. I gave up nothing. They're just fakers. They don't know what to do. It's driving them crazy. They're loco. It's driving them crazy. <laughs> talking about Kim Jong-un. It was unbelievable. By the way, I was reading a great article over the weekend that uh, uh, less and less people are trying to sneak out of North Korea because they feel their hopes that there is going to be some sort of reconciliation with the South and that some way, shape, or form, freedom is going to come to them, at least some economic freedom. I think that's what they're that they're crying out for over there. And I saw that uh, uh, they sat down over the weekend. They're going to get rid of landmines on both sides of the demilitary uh, zone. So we'll see what happens. But uh, Trump fell in love. We are doing great. That was a big, big problem. And you know the interesting, when I did it, and I was really being tough, and so was he, and we would go back and forth, and then we fell in love. Okay? No, really. He wrote me beautiful letters, and they're great letters. We fell in love. But you know what? Now they'll make, they'll say, Donald Trump said they fell in love. How horrible. How horrible is that? So unpresidential. He's just... He's something else, kids. I, I what else are you gonna say? He's something else. He's interesting, if not anything. And and I think he's got some good ideas. Doesn't mean all good ideas are gonna come off. Doesn't mean there's not gonna be controversy. Uh, and I was, I look, I was never like a lot of people out there were like, oh, I'm I, I'm completely against him sitting down with with you know with Kim Jong Un. But I was like, why? What's well, not gonna hurt anything? Nobody else would do it, right? I don't think anybody else could pull it off. And he didn't. He sat down with him. And you know what he did that, that nobody else would have done, even if they were sat down, is he took him somewhat seriously. And I think that probably helped out a lot more. He gets this guy more than the other presidents before probably got him or his family. So it's interesting to see what happens. We'll see what happens. Again, it's a long way away. Even if they said today we're going to start, you know, uh, you know, denuclearization, it's going to take a decade to get everything done. But I just find the whole thing fascinating. I really do. Three two three five three eight twenty four twenty three at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. So this weekend I was watching the football game and obviously the Cardinals game is on and uh Earl Thomas is carted off. He didn't want to play in Seattle. He wanted more money and wanted to be traded. There was a lot of things going on and he still played, didn't practice but played, broke his leg. And when they were carting him off, he looked over at his sideline and flipped them all off. And he's angry about this. And I look, I get it. I understand. And people say, well, he signed a contract. It's different because they'll come back to you in the middle of a contract and ask you to take less money. They don't honor all of those contracts. So let's when the NFL comes, I just sit there and I think it's a much different thing. It's not like baseball. Baseball, I read an article this weekend, and this is why kids should be picking up gloves. Mike Trout. Forget Harper and a lot of these leaguers. Mike Trout is going to get an opportunity to have a contract, and they're saying he's going to be worth a half a billion on this contract alone. 
Pick up a glove. That's what I told Jack this weekend. Pick up a glove. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. So, uh, my pillow, I love it. It's amazing. This weekend, I took an amazing nap, relaxing, watching some football. Said I'll, I'll get a little nap in between my work and the, and the last game of the night. Passed out. I slept like a log. It's amazing. 100% machine washable and dryable. Made in the USA. Backed by a 10-year warranty. Here's a great thing. BOGO. Buy one, get one free. Call 800-944-4975 or go to MyPillow.com. Use promo code Benson. You'll love it. Best night's rest. World's most comfortable pillow. Promo code is Benson. Go to MyPillow.com or call 800-944-4975. You will sleep like you've never slept before. Here's your useless fact of the day, kids. Get ready for it. A woman in 1997 died. And she had a $300,000 estate. And she decided she was going to give it away. Not to her family, but yes, to Charles Bronson. He was worth about $50 million, and she loved Charles Bronson. She loved everything to him. That is so weird. Death wish indeed. Have a good rest of your day. Night-night, Jack. This is the Chad Benson Show.